All right, how many's got your Bibles? Hold them up. Electronic Bibles. Okay, good job. <laughs> the question is, do you know how to use them? All right, you know it's going to be good because we're starting in the book of James. James, 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 James. James chapter 4. James chapter 4. For those of you that have been busting my chops about there's no new videos on our YouTube, you haven't been looking in the last 48 hours. So there's a, there's a slew of new information and new videos out there. So... Uh, you can take full advantage of that. I think, Nicholas, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think even on baptism Thursday, he's not up here? Oh, I thought you were, okay. So on Thursday, we just, we put it all out there. All the baptisms, all the words, everything. So the whole, whole schmeel is out there. So uh, if you got baptized and want to see that or missed your word and want to get that, uh, you can go to the YouTube channel and, and grab that. James chapter 4. Getting close to God. Beginning with verse 6. But he, capital H, he gives us more and more grace through the power of the Holy Spirit. Therefore it says, God is opposed to the proud and the haughty. But he gives the gift of grace to the humble who turn away from self-righteousness. Yeah, I'm going to pause. There's a difference between righteousness that comes from God and self-righteousness where you think you're doing so good that that's why God graced you with his righteousness because you're doing so good. Righteousness from God is not dependent upon your action or lack thereof. It's imputed. It's transferred from him to you. So any real righteousness that a person carries is a gift from God, not an accomplishment of their own. Number seven, verse seven. So submit to the authority of God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Let me stop there. The Amplified says, submit to the authority of God, resist the devil, stand firm against him, and he will flee from you. So before I move to the next verse, this is, this is a great tag on for deliverance ministry. When people are asking, how do I stay free from, how do I keep a door closed, how do I prevent access again, this is how. So if, if the enemy comes knocking on your door, we had by the Holy Spirit doorbell cameras in the spirit before there was door, doorbell cameras in the natural. You don't hear anything I'm saying. So when the enemy comes knocking and it sounds like a righteous knock, but you look by the Holy Spirit and see through the front door that who's standing on the porch, then you go, <laughs> I, ain't, I ain't open that door. And not only am I not opening that door, I'm going to call 911. Hello, God. I'm serious. Man, that, that the booger's on my porch again. Y'all catch anything I'm saying? So we have to be cautious that it's not just submitting to God. Submitting to God is half the equation, but resisting the devil is the other part. Remember, it always like, we, we don't, oh, I'm, I'm fully submitted to the Lord. I don't know why this stuff keeps happening. I'm submitted to God. Well, that's great because that's half the equation. Submitting to God is a piece of it, but it's not the whole enchilada. The second half is now you have to resist the devil. How do you resist the devil? You don't look at him. You don't talk to him. You don't conversate with him. You don't, you don't mess with him. Many fights that Christians are having today is because they wanted to prove who they were in Jesus. Oh, yes, I am going to go there. Too many, too many Christians got into fights they weren't called to, they weren't directed to, they weren't appointed to, it had nothing to do with them, and they inserted themselves because they wanted to prove, I'm a, I'm a mighty man of God. If you're such a mighty man of God, how about you use a gift called wisdom that God gives and keep, your, keep your, yourself out of the mess that God didn't call you to go address? Sometimes the fights that believers lose is because it wasn't a fight that you were called to deal with. 
Listen, I got enough fights to come to me. I don't have to go look for any. Y'all hear anything I'm telling you? I don't have to go look for no fights. I wake up in the morning and it's addressing me. It's waiting on me to get up. You understand what I'm saying? That the enemy is coming to my door. I ain't got time to go out in the street and say, hey, where's the next devil? He's, he's addressing me. So if you got so much time on your hands that you're looking for a devil, how about instead of you going traipsing through the neighborhood looking for trouble, how about you just get on your knees and pray for me? How about that? Come on. Huh? Come on. <laughs> I feel a little bit of a tood coming on. Okay, <laughs> verse 8. Verse 8 says, Come close to God with a contrite heart, and he will come close to you. Hmm. Sometimes, come here, baby. Come on, I'm going to use you real quick. Hurry up. Sometimes, if I wanted to be romantic with my wife, and she sees me coming and she knows what's in my heart and on my mind, she doesn't move closer to me, she moves farther from me. <laughs> Think, I'm serious. Now, because she knows my heart is not to give her what she wants, she knows I'm coming for what I want. Y'all ain't hearing anything I'm saying. Now, she's not my wife. Now, this is God. Here we come to God, and we got, I need, and I want, and I need, and I want. So we're coming close to God, and God is like, you're physically coming to me, but your heart is far from me. So in an effort to not encourage bad behavior, God steps back. Y'all ain't hear anything I'm saying at all. Y'all don't want to hear, I don't know that. You don't want to hear this, right? Because God says when you come to him with a contrite heart, I only want what you want, Lord. I only, I, you just help me to be more like you. That compels him to come toward you. As you come to him with a contrite heart, he comes to you. Got too many people, got ministry on their mind. I, I ain't done with you, baby. <laughs> got too many people with ministry on their mind, YouTube channels on their mind. I got to teach, I got to this, I got to that. And so they're coming to God, wanting to get approval. And God looks at their heart and says, if I turn you loose to do what you say you want to do that I didn't authorize you to do, you're going to get jacked up and you're going to misrepresent me. So we're, oh, God, I need, I need, I need. And he's backing away. We go, I don't understand why God's running from me. I do. When you come to God with a contrite heart, God, I don't care what you want me to do. You want me to go sweep the parking lot? You want me to put gravel back in a gravel pit? You want me to, you want me to work on whatever, clean the toilets, mop the floor? Whatever you want me to do, God, I, I want to do it because that's what you want me to do. That draws him into us. So when we come to him with our heart condition right, here's our problem. We wait till our heart is hard, it's bleeding, it's messed up, it's angry, it's bitter, it's all this stuff, and we're running at God all diseased, and it's not the fact he doesn't want to fix us, but he knows that we have to let him figure oh, we have to submit ourselves to let him do surgery you can't go to the hospital and get on the gurney wearing your stupid little dresses and start telling the doctor now you can cut on me but you don't cut on me until this 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 and i want this kind of stitch and i want to i want 10 people in the room and i don't you can't give that kind of strength if you want to get healed you have to submit yourself to the position and to the process that's a heart condition. That's why, they, that's why they had so many people that didn't have the right heart condition. That's why they have a, a book this thick for you to sign. You won't sue us. You won't tell us what to do. You won't wear these kinds of things. You won't eat or drink 12 hours before the, the, the surgery. Da, 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 all this stuff because they know over time and over history all the stuff that people use to say, this is your fault. So God says, I'm going to shred that and just say, if you'll come with a contrite heart, one that's broken that says, God, I only want what you want. That pulls him in. But when you come to him with an agenda, he just keeps a safe distance. This is better than you're reacting. Thank you very much, baby. Didn't she do a great job? See, some of y'all don't want to believe that God's backing away from anybody. 
Really? Really? God will back up from people because he sees in them a Judah spirit. He sees in them a Jezebel, an Ahab, a whatever. He does not want his name, his stamp, his, his anointing, his anything on them because he doesn't want to be misrepresented by them. Why do you think the Bible says, if you got people that ain't living right, they say they love Jesus, but they're living like they don't? Don't even eat with them. Send your hate mail to I don't give a flying flip at gmail.com. Okay. I really need to get one of those email addresses. <laughs> the, the last, so come, to, come close to God with a contrite heart, and he will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your unfaithful hearts, you double minded people. You want to know who the most double-minded people are? Believers. Lord, I want to believe what you said, but I see this. God, I want to believe that your word means this, but I, this is going on in my life. Double-minded. So God says, when you come to me, when you come into my presence, leave the double-mindedness at the door. You need to have a single mind and a single heart when you get into my presence. How many ever had double vision? Huh? You walk up and you got to shake somebody's hand, you don't know which one to get? If you're like that with God, God wants you to have a single focus. That's why I'm going to, this is why some people come to church. Because they're double vision everywhere they go. They're getting dizzy. They're getting frustrated. It's, it's irritating. And something happens when they come out of the house of God. For the time that they're here, single mind, single vision, singleness of heart. I just don't understand why, man, boy. I just need to get to the house of God today and just sit here. Sometimes they'll sit and let, let us do all the worshiping because they find peace while we're worshiping. Y'all ain't catching anything yet. You get what I'm saying? Because e even people that refuse to live right understand that if they can get close enough to the presence of God, it changes their perspective. So the, the, the one thing every one of us needs is this nearness to God that James is referring to, okay? We all need that. So firstly, we know that God is omnipresent. How many knows that God is omnipresent? How many knows what omnipresent is? How many doesn't know what that word means? That means that he's everywhere at the same time, omnipresent, in one place, one, all the place, all at the same time. So Paul said to the pagans in Athens, he said, and he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. I don't have time to preach this, but I just want you to understand God set boundaries for people. Check, check. God set boundaries for people. Yes, he did. Verse 27. Why? So that they would seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are his offspring. That's Acts 17, 26 to 29. So in one sense, we understand God's with everybody. We can say every breath we take is on loan from God. That's not inaccurate. But that's not the kind of nearness that James is talking about. I remember when Michael English was first coming on the scene as a, as a vocal, vocalist. Um, I still love to hear him sing. He's got an incredible voice. And... Um, Anytime you're around somebody of notoriety, they have huge defenses. And sometimes we're just enamored and starstruck just to be close to them. 
But just because I'm physically close, as I was at a Michael English concert, just because I'm physically close to him doesn't mean that I'm close to his heart. Now watch this. I was physically close to his physical heart. But I was not endeared to him. Here's what we make the mistake of doing. All I know is I feel better when I come to church. I don't understand it. I just know I feel better when I come to church. I don't always sing, and even when I'm not the one singing, I don't, I don't always pay attention and fully, you know, sometimes I'm scrolling through Facebook or whatnot, but I, I just, there's something cool about being in church. I feel different when I'm in church. Okay. Just because you got physically close doesn't mean that you're closer to the heart of God. And we have people that run to the house of God so that the devil chasing them would hopefully stay at the door so they can have some peace. And they think that because the devil is scared of God that somehow they're better off. You're no closer to the heart of God than you were when you were outside. We have confused proximity with endearment. And it's not the same. I am the farthest away from my wife physically, almost, that I can be without going against the back wall in this room. And even though there's great physical distance, my heart is still knit to hers and her heart is still knit to mine. Too many people, because they feel peace or reprieve or oh, they think that they're close to God when they come to the house of God. Just because you're receiving a benefit because his presence is here doesn't make you closer to God in relationship. God's omnipresent. Two, we also know that the Holy Spirit dwells in every believer. Romans 8, verse 9. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he's not his. So James is talking to the believer and still telling the believer, watch this, the believer who houses the Holy Spirit, he's still saying to them, draw near to God. I could be driving a car and Rachel sitting next to me and we'd be miles apart. So sometimes if we've had a little spat, I'll have to tell her, say, let's go for a drive. Why? Because I know she likes country drives. Do I? No. But I know that if I could get her in the vehicle with me, I have a captive audience. Y'all ain't catching this. Watch this. I have a captive audience that now I can begin, while I'm physically close, I can try to get closer to her heart. Because it's hard to get close to somebody's heart when they're far away. Y'all, he'll catch any of this. Because we do this with God all the time. Just because you happen to be in the car that he's driving today, doesn't it mean that everything is okay between you and him? You still got to pursue his heart. Because if you come for his heart, he'll come for yours. If you come for his goods, he'll back up. So the nearness of God that comes with being a Christian is still not what James is referring to. So what's he talking about? He's telling Christians to purposefully move into greater intimacy with God. You know how many people... I just need to get married. I just want to get married. I want to get married before Jesus comes. Oh, my gosh. I just want to get married. just want to get married. just want to get married. So what do you do? You stand before God and man. You sign the paper. You do the deed. You get married. You go, woohoo! That does not mean that you're in love or will be in love or will ever have intimacy in your, in your walk of relationship. we got a lot of people that, watch this, they wear the ring and they sleep in the same house. But intimacy is gone. 
I'm sorry, we tried this side. <laughs> intimacy is gone. No intimacy whatsoever. Looks like it. They look like a couple. They act like a couple. They file taxes like a couple. They take communion like a couple. But they are two individuals cohabitating. This is how a lot of people are. This is why the Bible says many will come in that day and say, Lord, Lord, did we not? Did we not? Did we not? Depart from me, you work of iniquity. I never do. Why? Because just because you cohabitated in the same building you know God is in does not make you one with him, does not mean you have any intimacy. Just because you happen to be in the room when somebody's getting delivered or set free or filled with the Holy Spirit or, or baptized in water, just because you're present for those events does not make you intimate with God. In fact, I'll be honest with you. A lot of people come to those events because while they can't seem to experience intimacy, they at least want to observe it. If I can't have it, at least I want to see it. I need to see it to know that it could still happen one day. Y'all catch anything I'm telling you? So he's talking about an intimacy issue. James is calling on Christians to not just be in the same room, but to be in the same conversation with God. To not be in a monologue with him, but be in a dialogue with him. And to get to know him. He already knows us. But we need to get to know him. So how do we draw near to God? We want a closer walk with him. We want to feel his presence. So what do we do? The first part, number one, is you have to prepare your heart. That sounds so generic. It's not. It's very specific. You have to prepare your heart in order to seek God. God commanded King Jehoshaphat because he had prepared his heart to seek the Lord, or commended him, not commanded him, commended him in 2 Chronicles 19. And in 2 Chronicles 30, King Hezekiah led Israel to keep the Passover, which the, the nation had not done in a lot of years, many, many years. So the timing did not work out for me done exactly as the law dictated. So what, what happened is King Hezekiah came to the Lord and said, listen, we didn't necessarily have all the time that we needed in order to get all the stuff done right. So 2 Chronicles chapter 30, verse 18 says, may the good Lord provide atonement for everyone who prepares his heart to seek God. The Lord God of his fathers, though he is not cleansed according to the purification of the sanctuary. He didn't do the physical stuff, God, but, but overlook the physical stuff and look at his heart. How many of you are last minute shoppers for Christmas? Come on, tell the truth. So you waited so long, you didn't get the gift that you know that they wanted. So you got a knockoff. Because a knockoff is better than nothing. So you presented the knockoff because you got busy and you're asking them, hey, please overlook the fact that it's a knockoff and just, under, just be, be grateful that I brought anything because my heart was in it that I had to bring something even though I couldn't get what I really wanted to get for you. Yeah. So God is far less concerned just like he said about David and Saul, man looks at the outward appearance, God looks at the heart. Another reason why I love that video, number one, those kids rocked that song. I mean, the harmony was there, and I'm talking little kids, and they were all worshiping Jesus. But their clothes had huge holes and stains and rips and no shoes, and man looks at that. God looks at the heart. That's why their worship carries an anointing. Not because they had the budget, not because they had the lights, not because they had the cool cameras, not because they had the right mix or the right uh, you know, promoters. It's the anointing that carried them. That's what made them want to sing because they felt, I'm a part of something phenomenal here that God is smiling on. He's, he's loving us through. See, some of y'all are terrified to sing. I just can't carry a, I can't carry a tune in a bucket. I don't want nobody else hearing me. I, you know. Listen, that's one reason, one of, one reason why we had the music so stinking loud. 
Serious. Because I want you to feel okay about singing from your heart, even if the tune is way off key. Because God is looking for the heart condition, not the perfection of the pitch. And I just, something's happening to me in this message. I don't, I don't know if you're feeling anything, but something's happening to me. So that, that's why there's so many professional, for, for professional worship teams. Pitch perfect. Play every note exact. Timing is never wrong. It's never off. Everything is fantastic. But it's hollow. It's hollow. There's no presence. There's no power. There's no anointing. There's no goosebumps. There's no nothing. It's just like. I'd rather worship with videos for the rest of my life and feel the power and the presence of God than I would have the best performance with all the light, stage, fog, big screens, and all that stuff and have no presence. The whole purpose of worship is to get in the presence of God. That's why the ugly kid who hires a band and can't sing worth nothing but goes outside the girl's house that he wants to take to the prom and sings off key at the top of his lungs gets the date instead of the ultra talented guy that comes out there and just rocks the guitar. Because one is showing a talent. The other's exposing their heart. (laughs) One is trying to present a talent and a gift and look how good I am. And the other one says, I stink, but everything that I have is yours. Uh, Rachel used to tell me this. I hope she still means it. She used to say, I would rather live in a shack with you in love than in a mansion far apart. So you have to prepare your heart to seek the Lord. How do we do that? God, I know I messed up. I know I ain't lived right this week. If it's performance you want, I got an F. But I'm willing to give you my F if you'll just receive it. Too many people trying to get their life in A-plus fashion so they can present an A-plus gift to God. That's not the gift he wants. That's the lesson we learned from Cain and Abel. God rejected Cain's gift, the best that he could provide, and he accepted Abel's gift because it's what God required. What What is the offering that God requires? contrite heart and spirit so as long as you come before the lord broken and pursuing him he will not reject you but you have to prepare your heart i don't know why i'm saying this it's it's gonna minister to somebody i hope or i'm just exposing myself I got more whippings as a kid than I care to admit. But even when I knew I was going to get a whipping, I had to prepare my heart to get it. So I'm saying, whatever, man. He ain't got to prepare nothing. He's just going to grab you by the back of the neck. and Watch this. I had to prepare my heart for the whipping. You want to know why? Because if my flesh got involved... All that the whipping would do was cause rebellion. To, you ain't going to break me. You got to hear what I'm saying? Because it's an internal thing. It's not a physical thing. So I had to submit my heart that, okay, he's not doing this because he just enjoys beating me and watching me cry. It's not his purpose. His purpose is he wants to direct my life in such a way that I won't be an idiot when I grow up. So that when I submitted myself for the whipping, my heart didn't get hard. This is why in some families, the kids that get the whippings the most are the most rebellious. 
the more likely to be incarcerated because the whippings only fan the flame of the hardness of heart and rebellion in their life. The same is true when you come before God. Whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. And if your heart condition is wrong when you come before, I should have known I couldn't come to you. All you're going to do is just discipline me again. I'm just, because your heart's wrong. So if you're going to come into the presence of God, you better have addressed your own heart and make sure you come in with the right attitude so that whatever happens helps you and not harms you. So preparing your heart is making a firm decision and preparing to follow through. Making a firm decision and preparing to follow through. David used the same word in Psalm 57 verse 7 when he said, My heart is steadfast or fixed on God. My heart is steadfast and I will sing and give praise. This is why the whole congregation can sing the songs every word and some invoke the presence. And some get angry because they're singing the same song in the same way, in the same tempo, in the same key, in the same everything, and they got everything but presence. And they get mad at the person who's next to them who's getting presence while they get nothing. It's because you didn't prepare your heart. Worship is not an activity. I'm skipping. David made preparations for Solomon to build the temple. There had to be specific plans that followed the decision. <laughs> we got too many people saying the prayer, getting baptized, and singing the song, I have decided to follow Jesus. That's great. But now you got to follow Jesus. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You can't just, you can't just get the T-shirt. <laughs> I did it. That's all there. You can't just get the t-shirt. Now you got to do something. So he made plans. And he says, we'll seek the Lord. And we today need to seek the Lord. How? How about by gathering every Sunday afternoon and Thursday evening? Maybe I didn't put the emphasis right. By gathering some Sunday afternoons and some Thursday evenings to sincerely worship the Lord. See, now you go, oh, I see where he's going. You see how he just twisted that? No, no watch. If I'm committed, I'm going to come home how many nights of the week? Every night. Every night. Why? Because I'm committed. committed. I've purposed in my heart. says we will seek the lord during a pre-service prayer meeting here's our issue we treat pre-service prayer like we do set up for thanksgiving meals and potlucks i'm gonna show up for the eating <laughs> i'm gonna show up in time to eat and i'm gonna bounce before the cleanup that's a plan and that's why you see people come to church when the worship's half over and they leave long before the altar call because they want the good part. It's like getting an Oreo and just licking the center out and leaving the other stuff. You know what I'm saying? It's eat the goo and leave the hard parts. Y'all ain't catching this. If, if, if you are, you're, you're struggling really hard to not let me know that you're catching this. So we, we need to purpose and have a plan to follow through with our commitment to God by pursuing him in pre-service prayer. You want to know what pre-service prayer is really for? It's twofold. Number one is to tenderize our hard hearts so that when worship starts, it can really penetrate us and our worship to God is pure. You ever gone to somebody's house and watch this, they had washed the dishes and you wanted something to drink, so you just go, here's something out of the singer. This'll work. 
That's what our praise is like when we just come from the world right into here and we haven't prepared, clean, set our hearts, set, got our heart condition right, tenderized our we're, we're We're just giving him, it all, you know it's for me, Lord, so it's going to be messed up. Huh? So the first part is we come to pre-service prayer in order to tenderize our own hearts and make sure that we're clean before God so we can, we can be penetrated by his spirit. The second thing is we don't want to just pray to him. We want to hear from him. Hearing from him doesn't happen while we're talking. Have you ever tried to have a conversation with somebody and they're talking so fast and so long? You, uh, um. So we come to God and we come to pre-service prayer and we're so busy praying, we ain't listening. And God is trying to make a deposit in our spirit that will make sense to us. Remember when we talked about hearing from God and how he uses our own personality, our own makeup, our own everything to, to get a message across because he's using who we are and, and where we're at in order to properly understand the point that he's making. So out of an hour prayer, you talking should be about 10 to 15 minutes and about 45 to 50 minutes of you listening. You want to know how to get on a teacher's good side in college? You make sure you have your notebook out and a sharp pencil or, a, or an ink pen. Paying attention so that on their every word you got something to write. You're, 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 you're paying attention to what they're saying. God too often sees this as coming in, watch this, to do our time. We're punching the clock, Lord, I'm here for an hour, so I expect a blessing by the time of the altar service. You're not punching time with God. Lord, here's my stuff. I'm going to say it so I can get it off my mind. I messed up this, 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 and this. I really needed this, 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 and this. I know you got it, but I wanted to articulate that to you. You said you have not because you asked not, so I said it. Now, whatever you want to tell me, Lord, I'm listening. And sometimes to hear what God has got to say, you've got to have about 49 and a half minutes of silence to catch the last 30 seconds of word. Because sometimes he wants to see, are you really are you, you really listening? You really paying attention? See, sometimes the waiting is, is part of, it's almost like a fast. It makes your body have to focus, not sleep, not wander in your mind. Not think about, oh, I got restless legs. I got, I got, I got to get it. The focus is, I don't care what else is happening, Lord. I'm waiting on your voice. And whatever you say, I'm going to be ready to get that. What if you knew when you came to pre-service prayer, the Lord had already told you, I'm going to give you a word, but the word's not for you. It's not that often I get a word for me. Most of the time when I get a word, it's for somebody else. Because the gift in me is for you. Which means the gift in you includes me. I'm going to say this too. Some of y'all have had words that you have wrestled with whether or not it's God. And so because you weren't convinced it was God, you sat on it or dismissed it. And you missed an opportunity to find out that it was God because you wouldn't submit it in order to be judged. How in the world are you ever going to know it's God if you don't test it? How in the world are you ever going to know your recipe's any good if you don't? Oh, or wow, oh my goodness. I got a friend of mine. Where's Nicholas? Is he in here? My Nicholas. Yeah, you back there? A minute ago, you were Michael, so I'm just making sure you're Nicholas now. Okay. So we have, a, we have a friend that makes fresh salsa. And he happened to drop a, a big jar of that on my porch today. And he said, not to toot my own horn, but my wife says, this is the best salsa I've ever produced. 
And he said, it's different. I said, how's it different? He said, I've never done this before, but he said, I included in, in that recipe two green tomatoes. He said, that's the only thing I could come up with that's any different than the recipe that I've been using all these years. But when my wife took a taste of that, she says, you've outdone yourself. It's the best salsa you've ever made. I said, well, I know what I'm having for dinner tonight. Just leave it at the porch. <laughs> he would have never known that the salsa would be better if he hadn't used green tomatoes that he had never used before and then tasted it. Some of y'all will never know. You, you know the recipe of trying to get to the heart of God has not worked. But maybe you haven't sung a new song. Maybe you haven't prayed in tongues. Maybe you didn't come to prayer with a pad and a pen. Maybe you didn't prepare your heart properly. Maybe you were more concerned with what other people thought about you being in prayer. And you, you had your thought on their eyes on your head while you're praying that you want to appear as though that you're real holy and, and all this stuff. Instead of just getting before God and not matter what anybody else thinks. So maybe if you just adjust the recipe a little bit and all of a sudden you have an encounter. You go, wait a minute. Something's different about this time than any other time. What did I do different? Because if we're ever going to improve, we got to find out what ingredients we're putting in and what ingredients need to come out. Okay, i got to make tracks. Number one, prepare your heart. Number two, it's pointless to prepare your heart if you're not going to make the event a priority. Don't tell me how you're going to prepare to make a meal if you're not going to prioritize the time to make the meal. Don't tell me about all the ingredients you done went to the store and bought, how you froze certain ingredients, how you prepared others, how you got them on the shelf, how you bought the special utensils and the special pans and all that stuff. And I, I'm going I'm to make this meal. But you, the stuff expires and you, it's growing mold in the refrigerator. you got to toss it out. Why? Because you never made it a priority. You got the ingredients, but you, you prepared for it, but you never made it a priority in order to put it together. This is what a lot of people do. I'm getting my heart ready. My heart's ready. But, oh, well, I got to go do this, and I got to go do that, and this got in the way, and I, you know, this, oh, you, isn't it crazy how every time you get ready to get in the presence of God, something, something comes up? Yeah, <laughs> that's called normal. You want to know one of the biggest reasons that couples struggle as they get older is they don't prioritize time with each other. You want to know how they got married in the first place? Work can wait. Kids can wait. Deadlines can wait. Everything can wait. I'm going to go see my baby. Ain't nothing going to get in my way. That's how people are. God, I need you in my life. So you get saved. Once you're saved, you get lazy. Now there's no priority in time with him and hearing from him and loving him and, and continue to make sure that our heart is, is ready for him. See, some of y'all give me these weird grins where you go, oh, that's kind of, huh? Okay, prepare your heart. you got to make it a priority. I'm not going to belabor that, uh, belabor that. The Scripture says to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Got to make it a priority or it's never going to get done. Hebrews 10, 22 let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, without wavering. That's why when a word comes and bad things happen, you can't waver on the word. For he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together like some do, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. Do you see the signs of the Lord approaching? Do you? How many have seen the recent decision from the U.S. to allow our missiles to be used by Ukraine to attack Russia inside their own borders? How many understands that that is a NATO violation? How many understand that that opens the gate for a possible World War III conflict? What does the Bible say? In the last days, there will be wars and rumors of war. They're everywhere. When you see Jerusalem surrounded at every side, by the way, Jerusalem is surrounded at every side. Look up. Why? Because that's where the answer and redemption comes from. Come 
So when you see that day approaching, we ought to be more sincere about our walk and our faith with God, not less. There's a real accountability in being a part of a church family. That's why a lot of people avoid it. That's why they come, you know, I've heard it CEOs, Christmas and Easter only. Because they come watch it to put their time, and they maybe even collected their tithe over the last six months or so, and they feel like they've done their duty. What they're avoiding is accountability. You don't need to know what's in my life. I don't, need to know what, I don't need to know what's in yours. Just, you know, I'll see you in glory. Well, you might see me for a minute, but <laughs> not everybody's getting in. What's your plan? When and how are you going to do it? Accountability is only as good as the heart that wants to be held accountable. I'm going to say that again. Accountability is only as good as the heart that wants to be held accountable. A lot of people say, just hold me accountable. What does that mean? So I'm going to check with you. Hey, did you get it done, Jim? Did you get that job done? Did you do what you said you were going to do? Is it finished yet? That's all I can do as far as accountability. But if your heart is getting harder and harder and harder against me, but you know what? That's the only thing you ever talk about. Well, that's what you told me to talk about. So people, in order to avoid the accountability that they preached and said they wanted so bad, they avoid coming to the house of God because they don't want to be held accountable. They want to, be, they want to live in la-la land because they've convinced themselves that the way they're living is okay. So the bottom line is this. At the end of the day, you did it or you didn't. That's it. Good intentions don't count for nothing. You did or you didn't. So how are you going to draw near to God? Prepare your heart, make it a priority, and then act. Take a step in the right direction. How many's ever heard the phrase, a thousand mile walk begins with the first step? How many's heard something along that line? How many's ever seen the picture of, 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 of a man at the bottom of a ladder and the first ladder, the rung is so high up, he can't jump and get it. That's the ladder to success. And so he never even gets to the first rung because it's so far ahead. But then you see the guy next to him and he's got a bunch of rungs and they're so easy to grasp. He's just, just all the way up. Why? Because a small step is better than no step. Just because you have a lofty goal doesn't mean that you're ever going to attain it. And just because this guy has 20 steps to get to his first goal, and you've only got one step to get to your first goal, you think you're going to get there faster, but a step a day is better than no step a day. What I'm saying is, don't minimize the small step you made today to prioritize your time with God. So drawing near to God is a process. When David was preparing for the temple, there was a lot of preparations. He had to supply the materials. He had to prepare for the work that was going to be put into it, the sanctification of the priests, the laying the, the, the thousands of sacrifices, the worship, all the stuff that went into the preparing of and the building of the temple, all that had to be accomplished. Lastly, the process doesn't end. You have to be willing to continue in the process. Continue in the process. When we do deliverance, I bring up the whiteboard of the TV and I, I show you the, the basic floor plan of the temple. Here's some key points about the temple and then I'm going to pray for you. In the temple, there was only one gate. There was only one way into the temple. And John 14, 6 says, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And he says, no one comes to the Father except through him, except through that one gate. There's only one way to get to the Father, and that's through the gate called Jesus. Secondly, as a person enters the gate, he first encounters the brazen altar. What's the brazen altar? It's an altar of sacrifice. Hebrews 9, 22 says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. So the moment you get in through Jesus, there has to be a sacrifice immediately, and that sacrifice was Jesus. No one goes to heaven without the shed blood of Jesus. It's becoming increasingly more in, uh, incongruent or politically incorrect to talk about the blood of Jesus. Did you guys know this? How many have ever been to the machines that you can put your name on a Coca-Cola can? So you go to the machine, you type in whatever name you want, put your money in, and it 
puts it on the can so you can pop out Joel and Rachel and Lexi and Nicholas and any name you want. Allah, Baal, any name. You put Jesus, it won't do it. Why is that? There is no name given among men whereby we must be saved other than the name of Jesus. How many didn't know that? Uh huh. Salvation does not rest on moral ethics. It's not about you just got to be nicer and, and, and make your willpower better. Salvation rests on the penalty of our sin being paid by Jesus, period, period. We all need the brazen altar. Then you go to the Holy of Holies. So when James is telling Christians to draw near to God, as a good Jew, he's thinking about the Holy of Holies. That's where God dwells. Hebrews 10, verse 19. Having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Hebrews 10 gives us three reasons that we can enter the very presence of God. The first one is the blood of Jesus. The second is the tearing of his flesh. And the third is he's become our high priest. Do not miss this point of anything you've heard tonight. Don't miss this point. Salvation is entirely based on Jesus' work, not yours. So how do we draw near to God? Then we get to the brazen laver. What's that? It's a huge bowl where the priests wash their, their hands and their feet. Sin was atoned for at the altar. Now they made it to this big bowl. So they continually come to this labor to wash away. Watch the dirty influence of the world because you can't be in the world and not have the dust attracted to you. So you constantly have to go back to this labor to wash away the worldly influence. What is the water in the basin? It's the word of God. You want to keep the, wor the world off of you? Keep washing your heart by the water of the word. Three more pieces of furniture, and then I'm going to pray for you. Then you get to the golden lampstand. It was the only source of light. The only source of light. There is but one that gives light. First Thessalonians 5, verse 5. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, they sleep at night. And those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet of the hope of salvation. I'm going to say it like this. I want to punch and run. Those who say they love Jesus ought to love what happens in the light, not what happens in the dark. Then there's a table of showbread. It had 12 loaves representing every tribe in Israel. I'm going to say it like this. We need to have a relationship with the whole family of God, not a tribe. You need, to be, you need to be able to have a relationship, a loving relationship with people that don't believe like you and still make Jesus king because you're going to spend eternity with the whole family of God, so you might as well start to get to know them now. Then lastly, there's the golden altar of incense. The incense was to be left burning continually night and day as a sweet aroma to the Lord. Revelation 8, verse 3. Then another angel having a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should 
offer it with the prayers of the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. So what does that altar of incense represent? Prayer. Prayer needs to be continual. What does 1 Thessalonians tell us to do? Pray without ceasing. So the lampstand tells us to walk in the light. The table of showbread says to live in fellowship with God and all his people. And thirdly, the altar of incense teaches us that we need to be people of prayer. So getting close to God is not just coming to church, putting a tip in the bucket, and showing up for Thanksgiving meal. Getting close to God is as much having to do with the preparation of you and making your heart right as it does anything else. God is always available when our heart is right. He's also unavailable when our heart is wrong. And you say, well, I just don't know if that's true, Joel, that God is at any point unavailable. Listen, what kind of prayers did God say that he would, he would listen to? If we pray anything according to his will, then we know he hears us. And if he hears us, then we have the petitions that we ask for. So watch this. What happens if you pray a prayer that's not God's will? We have no assurance that he even heard it. So if you're coming to God for all the wrong reasons, we have no assurance that God is even hearing what you got to say. Why? Because he's not looking at your actions as much as he's looking at your heart. Man looks at the outward appearance, God looks at the heart. So you, you might fake somebody out of which way you're going to go, but you can never fake God out because he sees the true intention of who you are. You might even fake me out, and you have to get up pretty early to do that, but you could. You might fake me out. You might make me think that you're just totally sincere and totally sold out to Jesus and really you're just some sort of Jezebel or Ahab hanging out in the house trying to destroy stuff. You might get one over on me. You ain't never get one over on God. And what you don't know is God is at my house at night ratting you out. Joel, you missed this one, but you need to go address so-and-so right now. Yes, sir. I didn't know that one. So you might get it over on me. You ain't never getting it over on him. And he tells me stuff. We tight like that. <laughs> Delayed reaction, but I'll take it. <laughs> Let me say it like this. If you're waiting on this body to be successful in the endeavors that God has called us to do, that does not rest on me alone. That does not rest on Rachel and I alone. That rests on us as a whole. So we have to do it together. Even as a youth pastor, I used to say it like this. We go together. We don't go. For the longest time, I've had the mentality, I want to leave nobody behind. Can I tell you that my mentality has changed? Because anybody that is willing to hold up the progress of the whole house because they're not ready to go, I can't prevent the house from reaching the next stage that God has called us to go because some stick their in the ground and say, Phew. They're singing the same song, but they're singing a different way. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. Huh? It's, it's important that if our heart is really prepared and tenderized, when we come before God, he's not going to say something to me that he's not confirming in and through you, just like he's not going to tell you something and then tell me something different. But what his word says is you're not even in a position to even hear from him if your heart is hardened and you want your way. And we all by nature want our own way. So I have to work on tenderizing my own heart. See, some of y'all don't understand that the people that you're in relationship with, God puts you in relationship with people that would wear you down so that you would understand what it's like 
to willingly give yourself already submitted and broken to God. Y'all didn't like that word. God knows who to hook you up with. God knows who to saddle you with. God knows who will help him to break you down so that you'll just say, yes, Lord, whatever you want. I can't, I can't fight no more. I give. I give up. Some of y'all thinking you married the wrong person. That's a pretty good sign you married the right one. <laughs> yeah. God's like, oh, you want that one? That's the one? That, yeah, you, you want that one? Okay, you can have them. <laughs> Sucker. <laughs> Hallelujah. So how do we draw near to God? Prepare our hearts. Make it a priority. Act on it and continue in that process. It never stops till Jesus comes. Hallelujah. For those of you that caught any part of this stream, thank you for sticking with us. For any part that you, that you caught, I hope it was a blessing to you and encouraged you or challenged you in some way. If you're looking to, for a church home, we're looking to grow the family here at 2632 Southwest 39th in Oklahoma City every Sunday afternoon at 2 p.m., every Thursday evening at 645 p.m. And so until our next appointed time, God bless you. Have an incredible day.